Thank you. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. So good to have you here. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm really excited. Um, these are friends. I'm going to call you friends. Um, I've got to listen to them um, present, lend their knowledge, their wisdom, their experience. And I would also say their passion. Um, and I've got to listen to them several times and it's been a couple of months and so I'm really happy I'm really excited to um, introduce Lara and Mark from Cardin Consulting um, they are here to present on organizational transformation um, so it looks to be a very good topic a very good conversation this workshop will introduce participants to the concept of leading first nation organizational transformation this workshop explores the critical ingredients that support organization transformation starting with cultural revitalization values-based vision focused leadership organizational development including cultural revitalization organizational learning and organizational design and supportive interventions no wonder why it's called organizational transformation <laughs> it sounds really good so some of the outcomes today you'll understand the importance of values and vision focused leadership and the importance of culture and i know that these two do an incredible job of really pulling and drawing on the values and why it's important within our um, organizations and communities that we're part of um, also, we'll understand what organizational transformation is, understand systems thinking and organizational development, understand the processes that support organizational transformation, such as visioning, forming, and involving, and oh, an evolving team of transformation leaders, inspiring and empowering the team to realize the vision, creating and ce celebrating habits of success. That's so important. Um, action research to support systems, structural and policy changes that support continuous improvement to realize the vision consistent with shared values. So we're, we're in for some really great and important knowledge this afternoon. So my name is Michelle Nevadomi. I'm joining from uh, Miskwichi, Weskaigen, Edmonton, Treaty 6 Territory. It's an honor for me to um, just to be, to be moderating this conversation this afternoon. Um, so Lara Uglanis, and it took me a while to get her last name, but I feel like I got it. Um, so she owns and operates Cardin Consulting, which she established in 1997. Um, she's committed to affecting positive change for the benefit of future generations and has strong values of respect, integrity, excellence, and community responsibility. She holds a master's degree from Royal Roads University, was awarded the Royal Roads University Founders Award. She has completed the Justice Institute Conflict Resolution and Negotiation course. She is a CTT certified consultant and is a member of the Council of Native Development Officers, otherwise known as Can Do, and is a member of the New Relationship Trust Economic Development Support Team. So that is the amazing Lara. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! Next we have Mark. He joined Cardin Consulting in the summer of 2017 as a business and life partner with Lara. Mark worked with the Sangji's, ooh, my apologies, nation to achieve their goals of developing successful intergovernmental partnerships and has worked with First Nations in Ontario and has gained more than 10 years experience working with and for First Nations. He has a deep level of respect for First Nations and possesses wi a wide variety of skills that helped him to develop intergovernmental partnerships and has been recognized by the Capital Region District and Governor General for Environmental Leadership, benefiting the regions of South, Southern Vancouver Island. Wow. So a key component of Lara's work has been a purposeful planning to enhance the capacity and self-determination of Aboriginal peoples through community-owned research and tools. So this Indigenous methodology and approach has been 
proven successful in supporting self-determination of Aboriginal peoples, communities, organizations, and nations throughout BC. So we are so honored that you two are here with us this afternoon. So welcome, welcome to CANDU's Links to Learning, the BC and the Alberta edition this afternoon. We welcome you. Um, I believe um, these two are you know, open to having some conversation, so feel free to use the chat box um, throughout if you have any questions or comments, and they are really good at responding and, and um, having that conversation together. So welcome, welcome, friends. You are muted. We Sorry. are back. Thank you, Aishka. Um, so thank you so much for the beautiful introduction. We really appreciate it. Um, we have about an hour with you and a lot of information to share, so we'll get at it. Um, and what we're going to be doing again is talking about organizational transformation. And there's a lot of information that we'll share. Um, you will have this recording for future reference, but this is going to be a PowerPoint that will be emailed to you as well, so you'll be able to um, look at this later if you'd like to review information. So thank you so much again. We have uh, are coming to you live from the territories of the Slawata, uh, Squamish and Musqueam people. And um, we'll be uh, going through the process of taking a look at some of the agenda items. What is organizational transformation? What does it take to undertake transformation planning? Organizational development supporting organizational transformation and implementing organizational transformation. So making it happen. And then we'll, of course, be going through Q&A, closing, um, closing remarks and closing prayer. Uh, but as Michelle had said, we do have a very organic system. So just jump in and unmute yourself to ask questions. We, we like this being a dialogue because we recognize and respect that you as leaders affecting change in your community, bring your own wisdom and knowledge and sharing that helps to support everybody's learning. So we're happy to hear from you and share our information and appreciate your sharing your information and knowledge and wisdom as well. So we'll get started. Introduction who you are. I think Michelle did a great job okay. introducing me. Aishka Osiem Nishkwilako. Welcome. We're coming to you from the Slate of Toth Nation studios here in uh, Cardin Consulting. And we're going to talk about organizational transformation. Um, it's a strategy to move an organization from its current state to a desired future state. And those are cr critical key points. Desired future state. Organizational development is like change management, a business discipline devoted to strategic organizational change. However, trans organizational transformation is a set of organizational changes designed to transform the nature of an organization from the administration of going from administering uh, ISCS programs to nation rebuilding. That's the goal here. So um, I, I just want to go through that a little bit further. So uh, one thing is the um, less and less common practice where nations will undertake during their work with the primary focus of just delivery of services and programs. And we're seeing a huge, huge paradigm shift in First Nations communities moving towards self-determination and self-government and nation rebuilding. And that's a big shift from trying to please ISK in delivery of programs and services to trying to serve members. And that's a big shift because instead of working in silos, you must come together and collaborate. And when we talk about collaborating and working to serve the nation, um, as Michelle said, we're strong believers in using that foundation of your own culture and language and your own values to be able to affect that change. And it's one of the most important components for any kind of change effort is laying that foundation of values-based um, change including taking a look at your nation's values to be able to understand what's most important to you and all of those people who are a member of your nation to be able to use that as a basis along with your vision and mission to say this is how we will behave as an organization. Now when you do this work we're going to go into some of the key components of affecting that change but I don't want to leave that values piece alone too long because we always want to talk about that. Um, when the nature of an organization is, is changed again rather than focusing and being um, centered around delivering ISK programs and services as an extension of ISK or as an administrator for ISK and changing to be self-determined, self-governing, nation rebuilding and focusing on the needs of members and serving them. It starts with a progressive and strategic minded set that learners have to have and keep in, in, in uh, top of mind to be able to set the strategic direction of the organization. So. 
Whenever you see any kind of change happening within an organization, whether it's your nation or your development corporation or any kind of um, organization, it really has to start with laying a groundwork that is relevant to your culture, relevant to your people, relevant to your values. And so it's really important to identify and create those shared values. And values are those things that are most important to you and most important to your people. And when you take a look at that, it's really important to have that discussion. What are our values? Hopefully using your own language as much as possible and defining what those things mean. So when we take a look at some of them um, uh, in Hatman Katla, the laws of the land, and that means including respecting elders, and that's from the Shtatliam territory. Or if we look at um, Hawaiit, um, Hershak Shawak, interconnection of all things. Uh, it means that how those laws dictate behaviors arising from that will inform the organization's change as well. So rather than taking um, for a development corporation an off-the-shelf number or setting up your nation again just to serve the needs and interests of ISKS, you want to be able to move into that more um, member service approach, which requires you to, again, take a look at your values, define share them, create them together, and continue to update them as you go. As you revitalize your culture, you'll see those things nuance over time to be more and more accurate based upon your shared agreements that you have. You also have to develop a shared vision. And so setting the path forward, that strategic direction to reorganize your, your organization or your company as a development corporation to say that this is the direction we're heading. So it has to include the purpose of the organization the constituents of who it serves. So not just shareholders, again, ultimately the constituents are those people who are the resources being are being used and that's your members. What must be retained and what must be let go of? Thinking about in your vision, what are those things that you wanna carry forward again? Um, what are those values-based pieces? What are those cultural pieces you wanna make sure are a part of describing that vision? And in most cases, what we like to always say is if you can, using your own language to use your vision statement. So Mark and I have had the wonderful experience of working with um, uh, uh, Stamanus. Um, and I'm, there's probably, I don't know, three or four others that we've worked with where the majority of their vision statement is in their own language because after wrestling with what their vision statement would be for about an hour or so, it started to pop up. Well, that means this. We're talking about all these great things around leadership, commitment, responsibility. And they went, well, it's all said in this one, one statement. Word, yeah. And we went, well, that's your vision statement. The, the weightiness and the, the depth of knowledge in their own language that spoke to who they were aspiring to be came from their own language. And they said, we don't even need to translate and we don't want to translate it to English. It is our language and everyone knows what it means and that's our vision statement. It was amazing. It was just so amazing. And what was impressive as, as, as anything, there was 11 people in the room and we, as Larry said, we went around the room for an hour and then it all gelled down to a phrase, a group of three words, and leadership said, this is our people, these are how we connect with each other, this expression is us, and that's what the vision was built upon. So really critical, and as one of the leaders said, we, got the whole, uh, we can do the whole thing in an elevator ride is ultimately the point. They can put their mission and vision statement out in their own language in less than a minute. And for them, the empowerment from that was significant. They felt they were moving forward. Nothing could stop them now because they'd moved, they've it un, 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 unburdened themselves. So it was really transformative for them. And it's really important when you can use your own language, your own cultural knowledge and, and, and wisdoms to inform your corporations and your communities as you move forward and make them yours. And so ultimately a vision is a desired future state, but we wanted to talk about these other things that go into a vision statement that need to be considered as you begin to articulate it. And then of course you want to develop a mission statement of how you get there. So the how shouldn't be mixed with the what. The what does this look like in the future. The how is the um, effective organizational development, effective financial management in accordance with your values. All of those types of important points to make in a mission statement of how you do things. And then, of course, you want to review and update the organization structure. When you're taking a look at a full transformation, you're, again, changing the nature of your organization from whatever its primary purpose and function was mm -hmm. to a new overall function and purpose. And that means it has to look different. It's going to behave differently. And what are those behaviors mean? So, for example, when we go from, you know, really seeing a lot of nations just delivering ISK programs and services to 
wanting to be nation rebuilding, um, uh, revitalizing their uh, self-determination and, and self-governing uh, rights and capacities, they then now have to establish an entire assembly process around how they engage with and connect with their members, similar with a development corporation that is, again, ultimately owned by the constituents whose resources you're using, not just the shareholders, but the members. You have to make sure that you establish systems and procedures and policies to engage those constituents who are the ultimate beneficiaries. So you have to look at the structure. What, does, what is this going to look like and what are the systems that have to underpin it to make it work? So that is one of the big, big pieces of really setting that strategic direction for organizational transformation at the outset. We love this diagram, don't we? The transformation plan should be vision-centered. Identify who the leaders are that are responsible to lead this transformation and what they, should their responsibilities be. Common tools can include the board, uh, board matrices for selections, custom election code updates. Those are places to look, start. How do these leaders fit with the structure and how does the structure system ensure that accountability, reporting and feedback from members, what are the rules and what are the policies that should be established to support this? So all of that has to be part of this evaluation. Research and develop high level strategic goals and objectives that can support the, revitalization, the realization of the vision. Based upon member input, internal and external conditions based upon research and analysis. So, so I'm just going to jump into yeah. that for a bit. So yeah. first and foremost, your member input would normally come from a CCP, which is great. If you don't do it, you still should develop a community engagement plan for your development corporation. So you have a community economic development plan that takes a look at what the member skills are, what their interests are, what um, they're wanting to see realized in the community, their own understanding of what those um, uh, strengths and weaknesses and opportunities are, taking a look at all of those pieces that the members themselves see and observe on a day-to-day -day basis because it creates building capacity to support the development corporation, it builds awareness and capacity to run their own small businesses, and most importantly, in starting their own small businesses and, and engaging their own self-sufficiency and capacities, they're creating a diversified and more vibrant and resilient economy. So really important to make sure that you engage members for all those long-term reasons. And when we take a look at internal and external conditions, sometimes we've seen um, community economic development uh, corporations establish strategies without looking at industry trends. Um, what are those things happening internally? Is there, or do they have enough organizational capacity, their human resources? So looking internally critically and doing that research and looking externally as well. So it shouldn't just be based on a few people's ideas in a room. It should really be with members and based on all the data you can find. So it leads us to asking what policies and planning and research should be established to support the organizational transformation and the long-term organization development. So got to do some background work, got to think about things that are going to affect you in the future and just take that time to, to, to really get connected with it. Undertake planning with managers and staff to identify activities and tactics that are realistic and achievable to realize agreed upon goals and objectives, including responsibility centers, deadline dates, and resourcing needs. So breaking all that down, it's, it's a lot in one sentence, but there's a lot of work and a lot of connections that go into that part of the process of that planning to transform. And so I'm just going to yeah. jump in there again. Yeah. Um, when we take a look at the, uh, the 2A, the, what policies and research should be established to support the organizational transfer and, and long-term organizational development, when we take a look at all that thing, those things we discussed around member input, again, build into those systems for your transformation what should be happening on an ongoing basis, not just to launch it. In launching it, for example, a CCP, it's fantastic to have that plan, but we've seen so many First Nations go and let it sit on the shelf for five or six years and then go, oh, we, we did one last decade. <laughs> well, it's, you're never going to have an effective development corporation if you engage members only once every decade. It has to be on an ongoing basis. So what policies and practices do you need to establish to make sure you keep those relationships and understandings alive and your responsiveness to those things? So again, external um, industry trends, look at those once a year, look at those once every couple of years. What's going on? Because the world is changing at an exponential rate right now. So if you're looking at clean energy, you can't go without looking at clean energy um, trends for more than a year. 
you're going to see the world change in a year in clean energy and solar panels. So you have to keep an eye on that. So it should be pinned down through policies to say this is what we're going to do once a year go through strat planning, including an analysis of industry sectors that are relevant to our organization. So those kinds of policies that underpin it. And then I just wanted to mention that in three, when Mark was talking about that large piece, yeah. what we're really trying to do and separate is two and three is that leaders set the strategic goals and objective based on members' needs and interests. And then really the, the meat of it, the majority of a strategic plan is developed with managers and staff to say, what are the underpinnings beneath, beneath that? What are the Good little thing. duck's feet underneath <laughs> all that movement that happens that really gets us there? And that's where it has to be done collaboratively. So that's your full scope of a strategic plan. And that's where, that, that's where the time needs to be taken to be reflective and making sure you engage effectively with all the different people to make that plan a success. And then review the systems of accountability of the organization as outlined above, and that should include reporting and feedback from the members. So you gotta have this circle of information coming back and forth to make sure you're on track, that you've met and are exceeding your goals, and people are, you're checking in. You can't just do it in isolation. You gotta check back in. So. And that last piece is really taking a systems perspective as well. Look at reviewing the systems of accountability. What is being used to enable these good things to continue happen? And what are those things that we're having some things that are taking away from all this goodness? How do we look at this from a systems perspective on a regular basis to ensure that those types of things, including reporting and feedback, happens on a continuing basis? So we look at our canoe, we've got our vision out there in the front where we're, it's leading us. We have our leadership and our organization coming back and, and reflecting on the goals and objectives of the, the vision, the tactics and activities to achieve the vision, and then the outcomes, the monitoring, the reporting on the progress and so forth. And that comes in the back. So if, using the canoe analogy, you know, we've set our vision, we know where we're going, we've talked to all of our, our, our pullers, and now the helm, the person in the back, is going to give affirmations that this is correct, we're still doing well, uh, we need a little more power on the one side of the canoe, or the other side of the canoe, and that's that feedback that the the, power, the pullers are getting from the helm. Get tell them that the pace is good, that they're approaching the the, the mark. They need to change their pace. These are any really important pieces, and they, it all reflects back into a big loop. And that's what we're trying to impress upon here. It's not a one trajectory piece. It's a big loop. Set the goals. But remember to circle back, get underneath, and support all the pieces as you go forward. Or you'll loop. And I, I like what Mark was saying because it is a journey. And how do we prepare ourselves for journeys, right? So if we're thinking about it like a canoe journey, we prepare, prepare, prepare. We talk to our people. We do all the training. We make sure there's a clear understanding of where we're going. We constantly evaluate and respond to the water and the wind and the environmental conditions. We look internally to see how we're doing and making sure that our pullers aren't exhausted, that we're communicating effectively. We've got good rhythm through songs and habits that make sure we do our best work constantly pulling together. So all of that coming together and making sure that the entire system is going in the direction we want it to go and in transformation that all that um, organizational development work is the heart of it is the beating heart of that transformation so when we take a look at and i put this weaving together because in taking a look at either the canoe analogy and all those large connecting factors organizational development again provides the underpinning it is that weaving, that, that slow, careful weaving and creating patterns, planning ideas, creating all those things that we want to see in this, this weaving that we're creating. And organizational uh, development that supports organizational transformation. So organizational development is that ongoing capacity of your organization to do its best work. Where transformation is we're completely changing what we're doing and heading in a completely new direction. So in looking at organizational development supporting that, Again, that big weaving that's created as a part of it is an alignment of strategy, structure, management processes, people, and what are we going to do to create rewards or enticements or underpin those things that are happening really well? And what are the metrics? What are we going to use to measure this? And what I really like about organizational development from this Kurt Lewin perspective, who also is the founder of organizational development and many iterations have happened since, but when you look at Kurt Lewin himself, he was a father of social psychology, a famous psychologist, but more importantly, he's a humanist. So in looking at all of this important work, he understands that our organizations are social constructs and we have to respect the people, the hearts, the lives, 
the families, the community that we affect. So it's really important to take a look at that. Um, so we've got a question from Cindy. What do you mean by metrics? So when we take a look at metrics, it's trying to understand what are those performance measurements that we're going to use to understand if we're taking that canoe from here to here, how are we going to check in and measure our success? So we're going to measure how far we've gone, um, the, how fast, how fast um, a whole bunch of other pieces. And if we're looking at a uh, development corporation, it's going to be return on investment, um, number of jobs, uh, um, number of management positions, uh, um, land sustainability, contributions, net gains to the land, any of those things that you want to define as the measures that you're going to use to measure success. Employment retention, employment advancement, these are all things you can measure and as we like to say, what measures matters. If you can measure it, it means something. So is it faster, cheaper, safer? Those are all measurable pieces that you can use as a metric to then make your evaluations based on. Uh, if we go back to the canoe analogy, you got waypoints, you need to get two of them passed before sundown to get to, this, to the village you're going to, and you've got to make sure that you're going there fast enough. So those two metrics are to be at those waypoints at certain time in order to be there at, to beat the tide. So those are the things we have to measure against. How successful were we? How many strokes did we do? All the things that go on inside the canoe, not relevant. We all agree this is the metric we're going to achieve. We're going to, and we're going to measure ourselves based on the success of achieving those milestones or waypoints and our home objective. So that's, a, that's, that's the evaluative approach to making sure you get the success you want. And the only thing I wanted to share with you in terms of nation rebuilding, if you're talking about the nation, you might have, for example, a measure of success uh, for education is improved number of graduation rates, improved number of transition rates, um, those kinds of things, reduce for health, reduce numbers of, um, or, or improved health outcomes. So reduction in numbers of diabetes, of um, all those different things that are associated. So what are those measures you're going to use to be able to know your get going in the right direction? So I hope that helps. Um, and feel free to just unmute and let us know if you have any other questions too. Um, so looking at Kurt Lewis, again, I really, really liked how this original um, uh, father of this idea of organizational development was a humanist and it had so much application for us as First Nations and we, we start to unpack this a little bit. So as an applied researcher and practical theorist, he founded Organizational Change Action Research, which is another aligned piece that we love because it's a way of approaching um, doing research and asking questions with community by um, empowering community for them to be in charge of the research project, to find the questions, be the ones who review the analysis and determine whether or not it's been successful. So action research really puts it in charge of the people who are um, who should be in charge of their own work. And he's also in charge of um, having in, or in, responsible for having invented group dynamics and influenced leadership research. So big, big thinker. And we I just love, again, how he saw the world. And I really like using this as an organizational foundation because all the rest of the organizational development theory has been launched from this point but they some of them have lost the, really the heart of it which is um, the humanist approach so when we take a look at it from that perspective organizational development supporting organizational transformation includes critical reflection of your organization the ancestral and traditional knowledge and current organizational systems and the environment the internal and external components of your organization so what's going on outside and inside um, and understanding organizational personality attitudes and beliefs that influence the behaviors. So how are people perceiving and um, supporting their thoughts and atti through attitudes that will then influence their behaviors. So it's really important to pay attention to that. Organizational learning and the iter iterative design of effective management systems and the transformative values-based organizational development strategies. That's the goal to bring those in. The organizational development deals with a total system. The people who constitute and have constructed the organization and respects this interdisciplinary dependency. And it's everyone inside the organization that's actually the organization. It's not the brick and mortar. It does a function, but it's not the organization. It's the people inside there, in between the bricks. They're the mortar. They're the ones that hold it all together. And I just want to um, explain what iterative is. Organizational development and iterative design. So iterative is the ongoing changing development. So iterative, iterative just means ongoing. So 
again, this is a really good slide to be able to take a look at what it is. So if you want to pin it up or put it up and print it off just to look at it and start thinking about it more. What I do sometimes if it's a new subject area, if this is a new subject area for you, I'll look at it and I'll start looking at some of the words, start thinking about it and say, what does this mean? How does this apply to me? And it allows you to be able to unpack this and make it meaningful for you as well. So really important to start thinking about this organizational transformation, about it being so big and so cross-cutting. Again, you are weaving your nation together. You're rebuilding your nation. So it takes looking at it from all these different perspectives, who you were, who you want to be in the future, what's happening internally and externally, um, what are the behaviors we're seeing and influence behaviors in the organization or of the organization, and what are the ongoing management systems that are being changed and improved? And again, what are those values-based strategies that you're using or should be using to be able to transform your organization to become what you want it to become? Organizational development is built upon providing opportunities for people to function as human beings rather than production resources. Providing members in the organization opportunities to fulfill their potential. Um, increasing the effectiveness of the organization to realize its goals, creating exciting and challenging work, positively influencing the work of members and the organization and environment, and treating each person as a complex set of needs that are important to their lives and work. So again, looking at it from a very holistic and humanistic level, because again, as Mark was saying, your organizations aren't that dev core and that asset. It is your people. And the more you look at and engage and listen to and really think about carefully and, and thoughtfully what needs to happen with, and have those discussions with them around what needs to happen, that weaving then starts to happen. And then organization development strives to encourage every individual to participate in the process of planning. Really critical to get everyone at the table to hear what they're saying because, you know, Nothing about us without us. You can't go out and change a department's operational procedures without the people from that department being a part of it. So planning, thus making them feel responsible for the implementation of the plan. If they're part of the planning process, there's ownership, and there'll be effective use of the plan going forward because it was made by us. It's for us to benefit us. So we're all part of that going forward. Engage employees to participate in development and realization of the vision of the organization. Bring them into the conversation. Without the engagement of your employees you won't get that vision realized that's they're the people getting you there encourage employees to become problem solvers give them that uh, strength and support to do that work uh, strengthen interpersonal trust cooperation and communication for successful achievement of organizational goals so looking at managing any workplace conflicts or any issues that are in the workplace to make sure that everyone's working well and cooperating and communicating successfully with each other create a work atmosphere which employs Employees are encouraged to work and participate enthusiastically. Uh, really important to check in with them how they're, how they're being affected by what's going on around them and make sure they can be effective with their work and participate enthusiastically there. Replace formal lines of authority with personal knowledge and skills. So again, that little breaking down of a barrier, we're all working together here for the same process. So um, do some of that formality between departments or between management. Prepare members to align with changes and break stereotypes. So everyone's got to be able to um, know their part in the process. And if they're being presumed to be something because of a stereotype, make sure you, you, you challenge that and make sure that they're, they're able to grow from there. So just a quick stereotype that we hear sometimes when organizations are going from um, a uh, strictly ISK-imposed uh, chief and council system. Mm -hmm. And we're really quickly seeing a lot of our clients move into a blended uh, system, revitalizing their traditional governing practices by building the capacity of family heads, hereditary chiefs, whatever you want to call them, to participate in their government. We're starting to see those stereotypes being broken because that assembly process that was removed by ISK um, and replacing it back with a system where the government has a relationship and hears the ongoing conversation and needs of members allows for it to be effective as a government, not just as a um, control mechanism by ISK. And when we break the stereotypes, what we hear and we're hearing is where we used to have, um, just a few years ago, I'd go into communities, we'd hear all the time, oh, chief and council's all corrupt. <laughs> oh, members are lazy. These crazy stereotypes that have nothing to do with us, and it's about the system that is not there to fulfill its need. And that is that 
the ISCOMPOSE council system, chief and council system, doesn't have an assembly process, a way for members to have their voice heard and participate in decision making of their own governments. So as those traditional practices are revitalized, we're seeing more and more that participation, capacity development, meaningful engagement, higher quality decisions being made, um, and it's breaking those stereotypes. And of course, this all creates an environment of trust, so, and that's what you want. So employees become change agents. You want everyone to be empowered to be able to make their decisions that, that affect their workplace and to take responsibility for those decisions that they make. And that makes them agents of change, which empowers them and makes them feel like they're doing something positive, not just for their employer, but ultimately for their community, hopefully, and for themselves. So when we take a look at organizational development, um, the, implementing the transformation means that in, t in addition to the leaders and managers responsible to implement the transformation, they should include creating a sense of urgency. The time is now. The time is now. We are the leaders we've been waiting for, and our nation has to change now. We cannot accept um, the quality that we're seeing of life or education or outcomes of how our members are living today. This is it. We will, won't take any more. This is where we draw our line in the sand, and we will be here to serve our nation and our nation members to improve their quality of life. So create that sense of urgency with a burning vision. Form a committee. Gather a team of people who are made up of um, leaders, managers, key staff, um, key representatives of community voice and community groups to make sure that they all come together and understand this massive transformation that you want to do to either uh, establishing or re-establishing your development corporation or establishing a new direction for your nation, whatever it is you're trying to transform in your organizations. Um, develop a shared vision. So as we said earlier, developing that values and vision statement to be able to inspire change and say, this is what we're working towards. This is our direction. Empower employees to implement the plan. So it's having that conversation with employees to find out what their interests are, what they're doing, what really is important for them to do and understand and develop it into an overall plan so that their interests to see the uh, positive change for community are realized and supported and um, upheld. Um, create a plan and create quick wins to motivate the team. There's nothing better than having an overall plan and being able to celebrate something right away. It allows everyone to lean in and go, we know we're part of some really good things happening and this is how we get it forward. Because once you create those quick wins, people feel motivated and excited about the work they're doing and all that larger scale work just becomes challenges instead of barriers. Keep the dream alive so the most influential leaders the most influential uh, influential transformation that comes is vision centered. So when we all buy Apple or Tesla or any of those large organizations or even Starbucks, we're buying a part of a vision. They have created these large, large organizational um, changes in our culture because they're vision centered. So keep the dream, dream alive because that's where you're going to see the most leverage for that transformation effort including continuous improvement and strengthening systems. So looking at the systems that underpin it, the structures, the laws, the policies, your people and building them up through human resource and professional development, capacity training, and creating those change agents, as Mark was saying, that support realizing the, the vision. Um, sometimes we go into a community where we've gone in, we find that, you know, there's one person that has a champion. lot of expertise, they're a champion, they're well respected. Get them on side, hold them up, make them a part of the project, make, make them a part of the leading project so that people can get behind it. Institutionalizing the change means, saying, means that you're looking at how every single person is actually helping to row that canoe. And that means li linking change efforts to positive results. So whatever you're doing, celebrate those successes, share those successes, and that will create more success. And of course, ongoing leadership development. And there's a little kind of image on the right that helps to get some more information. And again, you can look at it in the PowerPoint later, but gives you a bit more information in each of those areas to start thinking about and how you're approaching organizational and, and transformation. And it's a great visualization chart to sit down and put them down with your team because it's, it shows you these are the levers and you're pulling and pushing these levers to make things happen, one through eight, to make your journey successful. Stages of organizational change and transformation. In the phase one, and this is the psychology coming in to talk about here, we have the denial phase. Individuals go through withdrawal from the focus of the past. There, this, this, there is an activity, but not much where it gets done. Address this, change, this stage with information. Let staff know change will happen 
and why the change is needed. So really being firm on that because you're going to get a little bit of resistance. People don't want to let go of the past. It was comfortable. Then there'll be some resistance. In this stage, be prepared because you will see anger, blame, anxiety, and depression. Changes happening. This will be the most difficult stage for you as leaders. Develop in advance issue resolution policies and procedures to familiarize yourself and everyone with the policy and their rights and responsibilities and encourage staff to talk about what's going on for them. Listen and take these issues into account into the change and transformation plan. If you do not encourage staff to express their feelings, the stage will only last longer and become embedded by dysfunction. So you know what's going to happen. Know there'll be some resistance. Find ways to reach out and, and speak to why there is individually if you need to. Make sure that everyone's understanding their, why it needs to be changed. That's important. And let them know that you understand that it's hard. And it's perhaps not going to be the easiest thing for the next little while. But our stated goals and our objectives will make things better. And so this is a short-term interruption and discomfort. And one of those things that I always think about when we at, we expect resistance, it's really easy to just try this once in a while, even if it's something that's new for you, is just to lean in when people bring up, well, that's not going to work. Okay, how come? Be curious. Um, what, what are your concerns? I need to understand this. Okay, good. Okay, good to know. So now what can we do? And start saying when, even just using your habits, good feedback. Okay, great to know. Um, excellent. Good to hear. Those things really change people's attitudes dramatically. As soon as you, they give you feedback and you start saying, oh, that's good to know. Okay, good. How can we change it? Make them problem solvers and encourage that kind of, and support their ideas and thoughts. And suddenly they do become the change agent. So that resistance can be met by empowering them through those types of approaches. And often they can become your champions, those who have been the most vocal because you want them to be vocal you want them to share their anxieties and their concerns once they've made the understanding and the connection moving it forward they become very transformative in your process because now everyone says well that this change is possible so and so did it or uh, we can too in this stage the exploration stage there will be confusion over preparation chaos energy that you may like you notice a lack of focus to deal with the exploration you must set short-term goals we talked about this before something short and easy to get to the channel energy and get the staff focused so um, change the strategy up a little bit do some smaller laddering things get things success they won't think and they can change everything and, and then off they will go i think of mark's quote he always tells me how do you eat a whale one <laughs> bite at a time yep. and so commitment and this is the important part because you, you really have to be in this final stage the staff will start working together. You'll see better cooperation from the staff and improved focus. And when you feel the staff has reached this commitment stage, you can start setting long-term goals and looking ahead to the benefits that will occur as a result of those changes that they made. So short, 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 quick, quick success builds longer-term goals and success, which gives you longer term, which gives you that big arch you can go forward on. People have the strength, they have the, the comfort, and they have the confidence to move forward. You've helped them move forward. And for that, they'll be grateful. So when we take a look at continuous improvement in that transformation change, again, you have to look at everything you're going to do to affect that transformation change and underpin it with ongoing continuous improvement. So that means that um, whatever that change effort or project was that has been implemented, look for opportunities to add additional improvement to start to show that um, requires leaders and it, you, you have leaders and managers yourselves to expect and support ongoing individual and organizational learning, coaching, development, and continuous improvement. Finally, as discussed throughout this whole uh, workshop, it's regularly measuring the nation's success through predetermined uh, um, reporting requirements, as we said earlier, the matrices, um, upon key performance measures, or KPIs, and aligned governance and operating policies that enable leaders to review and analyze progress to realize agreed upon goals that reach the um, nation's vision and regularly share this success. Success breeds success. So really committing to that careful, thoughtful reflection on a regular basis on how, where are we now? How are we doing? And then sharing that and then celebrating those successes as they come up. And that success being, by being shared means that more people want to join in and get involved in that success. Everybody wants that. Everyone wants to have a feel, feel part of a successful organization, know that they played a part in making it successful. And as you celebrate and share what your success, successes you've had, and let's say it's just the short, medium term ones you've done, but everyone gets to see that you can actually execute a plan, you can achieve a certain goal, and that makes people confident. 
These are, I can see us doing that. Uh, my department can go there too. We can do that. So what we want to do now is talk with you to be able to find out what are those things that um, I, we can get from you in terms of sharing best practices, sharing your own experiences, and if there's any questions and answers that we can provide to be able to share with you anything that we've learned. Again, um, we are not primarily trainers. We always try and build capacity at every step, which is how we became trainers. But we go into communities and we do CCPs, community engagement um, or community economic development plans, governance policies, operations policies, uh, business charters, all sorts of things in community all the time. So we've done quite a bit over the last couple decades and we're happy to share whatever we can with you, including any tools you may be looking for. So just want to hear from you. How was the workshop? Any additional thoughts? Anything you want to share? And we'd appreciate that. So Cindy, can we ask your thoughts first? Yeah. I thought the, the session was very good. Um, I sit on the uh, on a governing body, which is a different type of system, just a minute. And the out before I go on it. Yes, um, I sit on the governing body, and it, it's kind of set up different from the um, ISC type of uh, chief and council. Now uh, we have um, we have the chief and two councillors here who are you know they're. They have three or four year terms and uh, they're voted in. Plus we also have uh, six uh, family reps, which represent the, um, the families within the communities. Oh, and what brilliant. they do nice. is, uh, and um, instead of chief and council only being the ones that uh, are doing the decision making uh, all of us as a governing body, the nine of us um, have the de decision making authority. There is no unilateral decision makers uh, out of out of this group. Um, anything that needs to be decided needs to go to this governing body. And we've been doing this now since probably 2002. And um, we think it's been working quite well so that uh, the focus isn't just on chief and council. And so therefore it seems to make uh, some of the goals or, or um, you know, uh, yeah, the, the goals that we are making to become more of um, a success. Uh, and we have actually got a lot of successes under our belt. And I, I believe that's with the help of this kind of organizational uh, group that we set up. And it, uh, because uh, I think that when you just have chief and council, they get beat up so much that uh, they're not always heard. And so therefore it kind of um, uh, leaves them stuck more or less. So, so um, I encourage any First Nation to try it out and see how it works for them and see if any changes go on. Uh, over the years, I've been with uh, my community in politics more or less uh, uh, since 1988. I've uh, been there at the table for policy development and recently the environment law and uh, other laws under the um, FNLMA, we're land code operational. And so we're kind, we took the lands portion out of the Northern and Indian Affairs, or I ask, or whatever they want. <laughs> whatever their name is now. <laughs> did, did, did we tell you the funny story? One one community yeah. up north says says the the word isk 
when you hear the word isk in their language, it means bad smell. <laughs> Same. Just saying. That's a good one. That's a good one. Actually, I'm going to tell my governing body that. <laughs> yeah, we like to share that one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so, Cindy, thank you for sharing. That's amazing yeah. what you're doing. That's the kind of thing that yeah, we try and encourage. We're, we're quite impressed. And it's so nice to hear that you've been doing that yeah, for that long. Yeah. And you saw those kinds of change results that we're talking about today. So, fantastic yeah. work. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, that. I just kind of wanted to, you know, get another perspective other than our own table and, and things like that. So, I think we're doing well. Um, our there are some behavioral and attitude uh, uh, issues, but um, it, it doesn't stop us from going ahead and being successful. So thank Excellent. you. Thank you so thank much. You, Brad? Okay. Are you able to connect with us, Brad, um, through audio? So I know he was saying earlier that he, and he sent a message by text, so he might be having some audio challenges in terms of connecting. So we'll wait just a minute. Um, Breezy or Erica? Feel free to un unmute yourself and, 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 and say hello. Um, Thanks, hi, um, sorry. Oh, well, go ahead, Erica. You go ahead. Okay. Um, so I have already sent this presentation to the whole leadership within Kitsis Development Corp and to the chief and council of Kitslis. Um, so right now we're in the midst of change. Um, I'm the property and assets officer. And so I've only been in my position for a year. They haven't um, ever had this position to manage Kitslis properties off reserve. So it's a new thing. Um, we're just getting into the flow of how we want these lands planned and developed and how what are the guidelines basically? And what do we want um, the communication to be between the development corp and the council and community? So I'm in the middle Excellent. and sometimes it gets frustrating. So this workshop is like golden to me. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Good to hear. So right now we've just started planning for the off reserve lands. The first parcel went very well. And now we've gotten to the second one um, where there's, it's a bit challenging. So we're all coming to the table this Thursday to, to start to speak about it and bring it all out into the open. So excellent, challenging, but good. Well, that's good to hear. Now you can let those other team members know we're, we're back on with the same presentation on Thursday. So if you can get them to come before the meeting into this workshop, or at least afterwards, then you'll be able to get uh, good effect there. Yeah, and if that... they're really busy, feel free to call us. We're happy to join your team and just share some ideas or thoughts that might help support all that good work you're coming into. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, Breezy? I just want to introduce myself. I'm um, Administrative and Communications Assistant with CANDU. So I'm here in Edmonton. So I just was here to really listen and uh, to get familiar with a lot of the, the presentations that CANDU has been holding. And I've been finding that it's great to go through this these webinars and keep us engaged even through this, this time of COVID because normally we would have a lot of these conferences in person and be able to network with a lot of people. So it's been a challenge, but we're, I'm really um, glad to be a part of, of CANDU being able to hold some of these and, and be able to still engage with everybody. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. And we got a comment from Brad who said, yeah, I was listening and enjoyed all of the great responses and I look forward to learning more of you to create communication. So wonderful um, for all of your feedback. We really appreciate it. And we are at our closing time. So we're going to ask Michelle to close this off in a good way. And help close us up with her final thoughts as well. So thank you. And it was wonderful to meet you all. It was. We're thank honored you. to be here today to help contribute to your learning and your success. And we hope to see you again soon. 
Wow, such a, a pleasure, such an honor, so empowering to listen to you too. So thank you so much. You know, even as I was reflecting, we had um, in our organization, we had a lead leadership change. And I really pr appreciate um, the little bit you talked about, the reality of, of, of organizational change and transformation is not always beautiful. Like you had those stages and I was like, I can relate to that and that. So I really appreciate the, the reality of that. Um, so thank you for that. And then the one piece I'm taking away, I mean, there's lots I'm taking away, but the one, um, you always have these catchphrases. The one, the one, the whale one, I got that one, but the one uh, that really stirred my spirits is weaving your, weaving your nation together. Like that gives me goosebumps just like thinking about that and all of the pieces um, that go into that. So, so thank you so much for sharing um, what you know. It's really good transformational information. So hi, hi. So I got up really early this morning and um, this spring I've decided I'm going to get up to greet that sun, get up before that sun rises. So this is my first day really just honoring that ceremony as that sun rose. And so it was a reminder of how special every day is. Every day is ceremony. Um, so I give thanks to the creator for the gift of this this day, this moment, this opportunity to connect with you all virtually, to take in this beautiful knowledge of Mark and Lara. Um, I give thanks to the land in which we live on, the, the sacred waters, the birds that we hear early in the morning now, um, the plants, our relatives, um, our chosen family. So we've been gifted so much and so we just give thanks to creator for all of the gifts this day has brought to us so thank you for joining us we hope to see you again and may you walk well hi hi peace